Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you all are. Namaskar, and welcome to this panel discussion on women in Tagore's literature and art. My name is Raka Ray, and I'm the Dean of the Social Sciences at Berkeley. But long before I became Dean, I was involved with the Bangla Initiative when I was the director of the Institute for South Asia Studies, through which we were able to bring Bangla to Berkeley. This program and this festival therefore brings me a great sense of joy. This is the 12th day of the two week long festival to celebrate Rabindranath under the aegis of the Tagore program on literature, culture and philosophy at UC Berkeley. The first of its kind in the US, the Tagore program is designed to showcase and develop innovative ideas about the work and legacy of Rabindranath. Even after the festival is done, the program will continue to sponsor talks and workshops on Rabindranath as well as other events. It will also fund a semester long visiting fellowship in Tagore studies at UC Berkeley. While the festival is coming to an end, there are two events left, the details of which can be found on the festival webpage. So now we come to today's panel. Let me first say, that the panel will follow the following format. Each of our three illustrious panelists will speak for 15 minutes each, followed by a discussion between the panelists that I will moderate, and then we'll open it up for questions, um, for your questions at the end. Um, if you're uh, already used to this format, you will know that uh, you should submit your questions via the Q&A box. Just take a minute to locate that box um, on your screen. Now I get to introduce our three panelists who have an enormously long list of intellectual accomplishments. So I'm going to keep it brief by touching on their work related to Rabindranath. Shupriya Choudhury is Professor Emerita in the Department of English, Jadavpur University. She has translated extensively from Tagore's fiction and poetry, including the novel Joga Jog, and written numerous critical essays on his work. Her most recent publications include the chapter on uh, Imagined Worlds, the prose fiction of Rabindranath Tagore in the Cambridge Companion to uh, Rabindranath Tagore, and Seeing Things, Tagore's Sense of the Real in Tagore, Einstein and the Nature of Reality. She will be speaking today about Tagore, Women and Space. Tonika Shorkar occupied the chair of modern history at the Center for Historical Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi, before her retirement. She's the author of numerous monographs and co-edited books. Her writings on Tagore include Many Faces of Love, Country, Woman, and God in the Home and the World, Rabindranath's Gora and the Problem of Indian Patriotism, Rabindranath and Nationalism, and The Child and the World. And she will be speaking about widows in Rabindranath's writing. Finally, Rushoti Shen is Associate Professor of Economics at Bashanti Devi College in Kolkata, but she is here today because she has worked on the socioeconomic contexts of Bengali literature. She's written on Bibhuti Bhushan Bandhupadhyay as well as Leela Mujumdar, and of course, on Rabindranath. She will be speaking about apparently minor female characters in Tagore's short stories and novels. Going alphabetically then, let me turn first to Shupriya Chaudhary. Welcome Shupriya Chaudhary. Thank you for inviting me to speak here and for making me part of this absolutely fascinating panel, which I'm uh, very much looking forward to. The focus of my presentation, as Raka has just said, is Tagore's treatment of women in and space. And I'll be focusing uh, particularly on the fiction and the letters. I'd have liked to have touched on the poetry, but I'm afraid it's unlikely to be possible in the time that we have. Let me begin by emphasizing that the question of space is central to Tagore's thought and writing, not only as part of a gendered politics of place, feeling, and habitus, but as a way of understanding and approaching the world. Uh, in a letter, and I think I'll just start by mentioning this, in a letter written to his wife, Menalini, in 1901, Rabindranath wrote, 
my inmost being continually craves emptiness. And the word that he uses in Bengali is paka. And it, not just the emptiness of sky, air, and light, but an emptiness within the home, an emptiness of furnishings and arrangements of effort and thought and fuss. Now this longing for space uh, is, I think, set in Tagore against the everyday oppressions of objects and persons, clutter and confinement, both within and outside the home. And it seems to me that for Tagore, this opposition is focalized through the lives of women. And it's therefore no accident that their experiences are represented in his fiction, both literally and metaphorically, in spatial terms. Now, it's been customary to view these experiences in terms of the much iterated politics of home and the world, the private and the public spheres, with the women, of course, relegated to the private domain, except when they are attempting to break into the public, the Ghor versus the Bahir, the Antapur or the inner women's quarters of the bourgeois home versus the Boitokhana or the reception areas. And this is especially because Tagore, of course, has written novels like Ghore Baire, At Home and in the World, and shorter fiction like Nostunir, uh, which was filmed by Shruttajit Rai as Charulata. And Charulata, and the film itself, um, shows very beautifully this uh, contrast of the, uh, of the inner quarters and the outer um, reception rooms. But what I want to do here is to suggest that there is uh, much more nuance and complexity to Tagore's understanding of space with reference to women's lives. Um, it's more than a history of seclusion and emancipation, and that it's central to larger debates within Indian modernity. So let me just begin by referring to the short stories, which is, after all, I mean, the short stories are the earliest narrative genre in which Tagore directly addressed women's experiences. Beginning from Ghatir Katha, the Ghat story, which was written in 1884, followed by about 60 stories composed during the next decade, that's the last decade of the 19th century, 1890 to 1900, roughly, when he was resident on his family estates in Riverine, East Bengal, and when he also wrote a series of letters to his niece Indira, which are co collected in the Chinnopatru, or later the Chinnopatru. Now, the stories and letters from this period produce for Bengal and perhaps for Indian modernity a poetics of landscape that imbued a familiar vocabulary and familiar visual um, elements with enormous resources of affect and produced new ways of seeing, inspiring also new modes of visual representation. This landscape, I have a quotation here, but I think it's too long. We may come back to it, um, a quotation from one of the letters, but we may come back to it in the discussion. This landscape is vividly particularized and yet it's described in terms of its most familiar and repeatable elements, clouds, water, sandbanks, fields of crops. Uh, think of the poem Shonar Turi, for example. And po it's populated by humble individuals brought face to face at critical moments with the unboundedness of nature. This landscape reappears in the work of the artists closest to Tagore, such as Nandolal Bosch and Binod Bihari Mukhopadhyay. And just as one example, I'd like to remind you of the short story Shubha, which is about a young mute girl. And she is described sitting under a tree at noontide, looking out at the endless expanse of the natural world and feeling her kinship with it. Now, but at the same time, this is not simply some kind of lyrical world in which women lead a natural life close to um, uh, you know, the, the, the landscape, as it were. 
This is not at all, in fact, the case. The short fiction of this period, characteristically non-linear, affective, and intimate, focuses very clearly on the cruelties, neglect, and oppression of village society, whether among the landed gentry or in the peasant class, which is experienced by women through marriage, domestic labor, and what we might call a gendered displacement the inevitability of exile and loss for women. In patriarchy, I think one might say, home is where the woman is, and yet the woman never is at home. This is evident in Shubha as in Khata, uh, this very moving story exercise book where the child Uma is married at nine and loses with her exercise book the only solace of her childhood and her claim to self-expression or Postmaster, which is again was filmed by Shotijit Rai showing the orphan Rotom and her abandonment or Dena Pauna about Nirupama sacrificed to the marital contract, and most remarkably, Shasti punishment, where a young peasant woman is um, sentenced to death for a murder she didn't commit. Most often, the vehicle for the tenor of feelings that would otherwise go unrecorded is a spatial image, as in the widow Joy Kali's giving sanctuary to a pig in her jealously guarded temple compound, or um, the moment of a married girl's leave taking on the riverbank, which Robindranath describes in a letter. And again, this is a very beautiful passage, which I probably don't have time to read out uh, now. But the melancholy of this landscape and this passage is re-invoked uh, in his short story, uh, Shamapati. And the melancholy of this landscape, which is evoked, uh, for example, in the city clerk's image of his potential bride waiting by the Dhaleshwari River, dressed in a Dhakar sari, vermilion in her hair, in the late poem, 1932, Bashi, flute music, might also slip at any moment into the un rural uncanny, as in stories like Jibito o Mrito, The Living and the Dead, Nishithe in the Night, and Monihara, again filmed by Shuttajit Rai, where the figure of the displaced, dispossessed woman and feminine desire itself returns like a ghost to haunt the spatial imaginary. Now, I want to take these reflections into a very brief uh, consideration of Tagore's novels, the form to which he turned at the turn of the century, just around 1901, after this early period of the short stories was, was finished, under the pressure of what he called Shangshari Ruro Sposho, that is the harsh touch of domesticity. And the generic shift from short story to novel is also a spatial transformation from the relatively open settings of rural Bengal to the oppressive interiors of the bourgeois household, divided, as we all know, from into inner quarters, the women's uh, areas, and the outer uh, areas. And this uh, division, of course, is only really possible in households up above a certain level of economic um, affluence. Uh, Chokhir Bali, for example, from 1901, this very early novel, Chokhir Bali, is spatially ordered around the contrast of the lower room floors of the house, which contain both the public apartments and Rajalokhi's bedroom, from which she attempts to control her son's personal life, and Mohindra's second floor room with its marital bed and the couch on the floor, which, is, which becomes the locus of illicit desire. And these oppressive interiors are contrasted um, with uh, Binodini's village home and um, you know, Onnapurna's uh, residence in Varanasi and um, other open uh, settings. The novella Noshtonir, also produced exactly the same year, 1901, allows a similar tracking of affective relations through domestic space, brilliantly picturized by Shotajit Rai in the first seven minutes of his film Charulata. Now, one could make similar points about the negotiation of domestic space by women in Strir Potro with Munal's final escape, Ami Bachbo, Ami Bachlum, um, you know, equating escape with life. Uh, and of course, about Ghoribairi, which is built on the binary of home and world. 
or Joga Jog, where Kumudini tries desperately to resist the property relations and sexual slavery of modern marriage by retreating into more confined spaces within the house, for example, the storeroom or the terrace. But in fact, the binary of inner and outer uh, spaces within the bourgeois home, which has always served as a figure for women's emancipation, that is to say, moving from the Antapur into the public world, is at least partly deceptive. For example, in Khoribairi, Bimola's emancipation doesn't actually involve her entry into that wider world. She never actually ever leaves the house. Rather, the transgressor, Shundi, is an entrant from outside into the inner space of the house, which is, of course, represented as a boitokkana, an, an outer reception room. And yet it is really part of that, uh, that world of the house, as it were. It is part of a, of a household that can, is still, to some extent, controlled by women. Uh, in the sense that the Mejorani, for, at one point, forbids Shundip's entry into the Boitokkana. It's an intermediate space in which um, Bimola's uh, intellect, intellectual and moral education is accomplished. So to the garden wilderness in which Charu and Omul discuss their plans for the reform of the household uh, is, I think, an intermediate space. It's not really the outside. Uh, uh, nor is it um, the, 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 the inside as such. So one has to ask, and I have to you know, wind up now because obviously I can't uh, go on on these. These are very, very critical, you know, complex and tricky questions of where the in, inner and where the outer are. Uh, one has to ask, where is women's space? Where is the space for women in, in this world? Both Charulata and Kumudini are textually represented as building a protective carapace, a place of self-imposed seclusion within the domestic interiors in which they are trapped. And I'm quoting from Jogajo. In this way, Charu dug a tunnel under the entire structure of her domestic tasks and duties. And in that unlighted, silent darkness, she built a temple of secret grief. For both, for both Charulata and Kumudini, the lost self they seek to recover is associated with a village past, with the empty sprawling fields, the copses of wild tamarisks, the towpath that they have left behind in, ch in childhood. Charu writes, uh, her first piece of writing, original creative writing, is about her village, Kalitola, the boat she's left behind. And Kumudini constantly feels the weight and pressure of this urban space in which she's confined and thinks of the village, which was her home. This might suggest a contrast, not so much between the public and the private, the core and the bahi, but of country and city, the remembered village and the colonial town, one that articulates through the figure of women, uh, the figures of women, the central debates for Tagore as, of, as for Gandhi of our modernity. And Ravi Vasudevan writing on Charulata makes very interesting points about this. But of course, these are points about Shottajit Rai rather than about Tagore. For Tagore's women, this lost self, and I think th this is the point that I finally want to make, the self that is linked to unbounded or open space, as it is, for example, in the poem Niruddesh Jatra, important though it is, serves as a kind of placeholder a dialectical counter in the struggle for self-representation, and it remains, as the early fiction shows, always already lost. It's like the ideal past for which modernity yearns, but to which it cannot return. Because women, at least in the novels that we have, have no space as such. They only have a place to which they are assigned. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that fascinating and, and somewhat depressing but <laughs> thought-provoking um, talk. Um, let me turn now to Tonika Sharkar. So 
thank you all for having me on this very distinguished panel. I wish I could see you all and chat with you all, but anyway. So Shupriya's was a very hard act to follow. I won't even try it. I'll first begin with a few broad points about Rabindranath's gender problematic, and then a discussion of the narrative and political functions of Hindu widowhood in two of his novels. Rabindranath never put together his thinking on gender in a single discursive space, but all his fiction was dense with complex multivalent and often conflicted descriptions of human and social relationships. So my Rabindranath is not self-identical, uh, homogeneous, but shifting and a very contradictory person. Young scholar Rajar Shichandra identifies distinct shifts in his social thinking, which he connects with Rabindranath's changing personal history and changing socio-political context. Rabindranath started off as a young rebel, excoriating Hindu familial practices and sacred texts in the 1880s and early 90s, but then followed a rather conservative turn during his brief association with nationalist politics between 1901 and 8. Thereafter began an extended phase of very critical engagement with gender and untouchability and with the creed and praxis of nationalism, and that lasted his lifetime. His personal conduct, however, we noticed frequently ran contrary to his intellectual trajectory. Even in his rebellious years, he, a man of 23, had married a girl of nine, Uma's age as, uh, you know, in Khata that uh, Shupriya mentioned, without a murmur of protest. Rinalini was not allowed to visit her natal village. She became a mother when she was hardly 11. She died at 29 of draining childbirths. Though her husband was always warm and affectionate and she was briefly schooled by the family, she nonetheless seems to be the least visible, least accomplished wife in her generation of women in the Tagore family. Tagore sisters and sisters-in-law were quite remarkable, high achieving women and Tagore loved and admired them all. Brinalini instead excelled in cooking, donated her jewelry to help found Shantiniketan school. She took care of its young students. So performing very valuable, but conventionally feminine roles. In the next generation, Tagore's nieces and uh, Shupriya mentioned Indira Devi, they married late in life and became noted public figures. And he was very close to them. But he married off his own preteen or early teen daughters with considerable dowries and advised them to be docile wives. So by the standards of his family, lives of his own women had to be framed in conservatism. Why am I talking about that when we are celebrating Tagore as we should? The discrepancy between the politics of the personal and the discursive, I think, threw up a very rich and productive tension. He deeply valued the beauty and grace of patriarchal paternalism, but he also recognized the injustices that structured the comfort zone. His own compromises with tradition gave him especially acute insights into its social power and its human costs. Without a decisive resolution in favor of either, divergent values ran parallel in his works. Transgressive wife Bimala of novel Ghare Baive, Home and the World, wants to revert to the image of the gentle wife, content to love and worship. A revolutionary hero Atin in Charadhyay uh, aestheticizes the domesticated woman. Sheba or service, a very resonant word for Tagore, is always reserved for women. At the same time, Bimala has already reinvented her life on her own terms, disastrous though they may be, and acquired an in, a new self that is indelible. Her sister-in-law, a woman of the old school, is condemned to harsh widowhood for the sake of a husband who had humiliated her all his life. Bimala's husband, Nikhilesh, abandons his ownership claims over her desires or her politics. So the idealization of the good wife cohabitated with a sharp male guilt, and this sharp male guilt was a dominant characteristic 
of early 19th century social reformism, social and religious reforms, with which Tagore largely associated himself. Ram Mohan Roy, who sought to abolish widow burnings, and Ishwar Chandra Bidyashagur, who struggled to legalize widow remarriages, had, for the first time in our entire history, represented the Hindu woman not as the good wife or as nubile objects of male desire, but as damaged and crippled persons. Rabindranath added to this five unusual themes. First, patrilocality and the stolen childhood of girls dragged into marriages with perfect strangers. And Shupriya already in, um, mentioned Kata. There a husband strangles his little wife's joyful adventures with reading and writing. As Rabindranath married off his own daughters to incompatible and hostile households, he composed the short fiction Hoimonti, transposing the father's guilt to a husband's confession. And I quote from him, quote from Hoimonti. Don't you know I was among the crowd which demanded that Ram abandons Shita? If I now fail to sacrifice my beloved at the altar of family, how can I be true to my inherited blood? End of quote. Second, very unconventionally, a few fictionalized wives spurn the shelter of marriage and escape from an unjust family. Third, equally uh, controversially or perhaps more so, he acknowledges her emotional autonomy. In short story Nashtunir and in Kharibaire, husbands respect their wives' love for another man. This radically refashions masculinity, a point that Shumit, has, Shumit Sharkar has made. Fourth, he tried late in life to understand what I'd call the new women of the interwar generation. Intellectuals, political <clears throat> activists, professionals, or even fashionistas. They did remain rather opaque. He couldn't quite represent them convincingly, but he was curious and non-judgmental. Finally, he approached the problem of widowhood in distinctive and difficult ways. Strangely, in his several laudatory essays on Ram Mohan Roy, Rabindranath did not mention Roy's campaigns against Shati, widow burning, or his arguments for property rights for widows. In his uh, essay on Bidda Shagur, he does mention the remarriage campaigns, but with two rather curious transfigurations. One, he persistently describes them as campaigns for the remarriage of child widow, Bal Bidho Babi Bahu. That's the term he always uses, even though Bidda Shagur himself never sought an age limit. Second, he explains Bidda Shagur's gender concern as quote unquote chivalry, which he translates as daya, compassion, mercy, charity even, coming down from the strong to the weak. Bidda Shagur though had actually invoked the widow's natural rights. And I quote from Bidda Shagur, do their bodies turn to stone the moment their husbands die? He questioned the Brahmanical norm, which allowed infinite polygamy to the husband and which doomed the widow to perpetual self-mortification. He had sought to denaturalize injustice. Robindranath instead partly naturalized it as an effect of her innate vulnerability. His tributes therefore partly evade or eviscerate their achievements. Bo Thakur Anir Hart, the first novel, uh, 1883, uh, was historical fiction. Chokher Bali, 1903, his third novel, uh, and his first great one, and Nihar Ranjan Rai has pointed this out, narrated domestic history instead. And please forget the film that was made on Chokher Bali. Uh, contemporary discourses had exclusively focused on the young widow. Uh, some fearing her blocked sexuality, trying to keep it even more blocked, others preferring a release for it in a second marriage. The young widow being sexually a no man's land, men often exploited her for their extramarital desires. Yet they punished her too as a promiscuous threat to marital or domestic tranquility. <clears throat> in Bodhakura Nirhat, Robindranath too was totally unforgiving about the widow's trespass. 
even though in that novel, the man makes the first overtures, but then he repents prodigiously. Spurn, the widow hatches a devilish plot to wreck his life. His needs and emotions are not unpacked, but simply branded as ferociously de destructive. Interestingly, Rabindranath wrote this novel in his liberal phase, but he came a long way in 1903 uh, when he wrote Chokher Bali, though it was written in the middle of the conservative period, uh, what I would call the conservative period. Hindu widowhood, uh, Hindu widowhood at that time still implied a state of permanent inauspiciousness, permanent penance. Pressed within a steel frame of punishing regulations, the widow lacked rights over natal or matrimonial home or inheritance. Remarriage, though a legal success by now, was still a social failure. <clears throat> Jokhir Bali captures these various predicaments. It's nuanced and layered in terms of construction and characterization in its focus on everyday details of ordinary life. Three prisms that he used pluralize, uh, pluralize and diversify widowhood problems beyond the sexual domain, though that's not neglected either. The indigent widow's material dependency, the young widow's yearning for love and a home of her own, the widowed mother's consuming love for the son. <clears throat> now I'll make a, um, what may seem a rather eccentric point because I think Rabindranath's use of widowhood as form, as archetype is embedded in his distinctive personal philosophy, which he often articulated in songs and essays. It's a dialectic between great loss and greater gain between tragedy and catharsis. Profound loss and sorrow, he always thought, clear a space for the entry of the eternal into human lives. It brings transcendence, deliverance, but only if humans recognize loss as a, trip, as a route to inner peace and fulfillment. And I quote from one of his songs, when the storm wrecked my home that night, little did I realize that you, that is divinity, have come in through the broken door. If we transcribe the spiritual conviction in social terms, the widow appears as a renunciate uh, par excellence once she embraces her spiritual potential. In the novel, Annapurna, the classic have not figure, has no home, no child, or wealth of her own. Yet she, and she alone in the novel, reaches perfect serenity and grace by submitting to fate, by transfiguring her earthly longings into spiritual ones, and thereby entirely overcoming the vulnerability that household, shangshar, world had thrust upon her. As she says, and I quote, once I thought I was cheated by life. Then I thought, then I came to know that God had been keeping a meticulous account and he has made up for every loss, made up and more than made up for every loss. The second widow Binodini is young, passionate, brilliant and beautiful. She has a talent for creating a lovely domestic environment, but she lacks her own home. She in the novel is a perpetual and angry question mark. She always asks why, why, why I deserve nothing from life. Her starved body awakens to jealous hunger as she watches Mohenjo's love for a wife who is nowhere as desirable as she is. When Bihari, a very moral virtuous man, spurns her pro-offered love, <clears throat> she seduces Mohendra vindictively, vindictively to wreak vengeance on the world which has cheated her. Mohendra is a weak and amoral substitute and her vindictiveness practically ruins the family. Eventually she comes to realize uh, where she went wrong and renounces sexual and domestic aspirations. When Bihari finally returns her love, she chooses to remain celibate. The third widow Rajlakshi uh, Raj has property and a son. These were the only conditions for a successful widowed life, but her hold on both is tenuous. 
Her son is her route to power. He is the only man in her life. Consequently, she grips him, to her, uh, grips him with hungry love and is fiercely jealous when he marries. Her love merges tropes of passionate maternalism with a tinge of eroticism. It resembles, as I quote, a full breast aching with unshed milk. Possessiveness leads to disaster and she too finally repents. So both Binodini and Rajlokhi embrace Annapurna's renunciatory model as the only way to peace for the condition of widowhood. Rabindranath, it seems, transvalued the social discipline of widowhood into existential pain, as well as into spiritual possibilities. Accepting social norms, he reveals the costs of transgressing them. This chimes with a cultural frame of Hindu widowhood whose disciplinary regime seeks to display itself as willed improvisations of self-sacrifice by the widow herself. Those whom society wounds need to appear as willing tools of their own oppression. This is the key word for hegemony. But, and a big but, narrative conclusions may not necessarily articulate authorial intentions, nor capture the full range of novelistic possibilities. Tropes and plotting devices can tell a different story here, and language creates a surplus beyond the obvious moral of the story. The absences in widowed lives, so very powerfully articulated, problematize the surface thrust, the renunciatory model. Religion prescribes conjugal and maternal love and dedicated domesticity as the woman's sole occupation, vocation, religion. What happens when she can have none of that? Is her perversion of social injunctions her fault or the fault of the injunctions themselves? Given the complex interlocking of longing, frustrations, dreams, and desires that the novel patiently unfolds layer by layer, we are eventually left, I think, with a sense of tragic waste, a thin, joyless peace which offered a weak resolution for the tempestuous emotions, passions, and desperate needs that language conveys. So in the novel, in the domain of the novel, textual space and crafting allow the play of a range of contradictions and ambiguities, material, social, moral, and emotional. Narrative construction and conclusion cohabit yet diverge within the same fictional container. Rendering the text wide open, weakening its overt message and pulling it in contrary directions. So, as I said, uh, Tagore or even a single novel by Tagore is not self-identical. It's not all of a piece. Its resolutions are contradicted by narrative construction, and that is why it's powerful. Therein lies its power, their power. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Tonigadi. Um, let me turn it over now for our last uh, panelist, um, Rushoti Shen. Namaskar. I express my sincere gratitude to the Institute for South Asia Studies, University of California, Berkeley, for inviting me in the illustrious occasion of Tagore program. What I would be presenting today is just a meager introduction to the textual analysis of a few female characters from Tagore's short stories and novels. With my trivial ability, let me select some characters which can be called minor or apparently insignificant, consequently less discussed. Stolen goods, Churai Dhon, 1933, is a lesser known yet delicate and subtle story of Tagore. Bibhabhuti was the wife of a renowned professor of mathematics who had no belief in gods and goddesses. 
all his unhindered faith was focused on constellations. Their only daughter, Shunetra, considered the stars and planets to be her steadfast guardians. Bhibhavati believed in her own special deity, unlike them. In her early youth, Shunetra fell in love with the narrator, who was one of the favorite students of her father. When the narrator confided his feelings for Shunetra to Bhibhavati, she compared Shunetra's horoscope with his to tell him that neither the father nor the daughter would consent to this marriage. Bhibhavati's position was quite different. I know you and I also know my daughter's mind. I don't need to turn to the heavens to find out anything more. This utterance of Bibhabuti persuades me to include her in my study. Shunetra insisted that she would remain unmarried and devote the rest of her days in learning. Bibhabuti handed the narrator Shunetra's horoscope to get his own horoscope matched with it. I can't stand my daughter's suffering for no good reason. Shunetra came to know of this episode of horoscope fixing from her husband more than two decades after her marriage. Bibhavuti had passed away a way before. Her rational and bold voice has not yet been much considered for studying dimensions of women in Tagore literature. May the readers at times discover elements of Anundamui in Bibhabuti. Stolen Goods was composed more than two decades after Tagore had written Bora. The space covered by Bibhabuti is not adequate in the diverse horizon of Tagore's creations. Nevertheless, her words and actions ring so distinct to the readers. The essence of home was significant in the portrayal of Mejo Bourani of the home and the world, Ghore Baire, 1916. The winds of change blowing into confines of a home meant neither social involvement nor political awareness to Mejo Bourani. The widowed and childless sister-in-law of Nikhilesh had never left the palace of Shukshayor since she first entered it as a bride at a tender age of nine. When she expressed her decision to leave this palace for Kolkata along with Nikhilesh and Bimola, Nikhilesh felt that the branching canopy of their long relationship had spread and broadened all over this old house. Nikhil and his major Bourani, who remained nameless throughout the novel, were bosom playmates in their childhood. As they grew up, their mutual joys and sorrows evolved into deeper tones of intimacy. Majorani had this one relationship left in all the world. The unfortunate woman had cherished it with all tenderness. Nikhil realized how deeply she had felt their proposed separation and made up her mind to drift away towards the unknown. Tegu's lifelong observation of the household of Thakurbari blended with his intense creativity, conceived several characters concealing and revealing reality. Thus, the deconstruction of Mejo Bourani may bring Tagore back to his Notun Bhutan. Does Kadumburi remain obscure in the various women in Tagore literature through myriads of excuses? A vivid reader of Bengali literature, a fervent music admirer, a tender nurse in ailments, yet a horse riding Kadumburi, and an untimely widowed Majorani frenzy in the cacophony of occasions, bringing Bimola from the drawing room to the inside of the household seems so disjoined. The confusions and mistakes 
between life in lore and lore in life remain perennial. Majorani told Nikhilesh that she would not live a life again as a woman. Let what I have had to bear end with this one bar. Na bhai, me jan monie ar noy, ja shwechi ta akta jan me ropod diye jai, ja phir ar ki shoy. Kadumburi Devi's demise was in the year 1884. Tagore searched for the alternatives of Kadumburi's suicide throughout Golpogucho through turbulent imagination, returning to perpetual gloom. The readers may recall in this context the stories like Giribala, Man Bhanjun, 1895, Broken Nest, Nostonir, 1901, House Number no. One, Koila Nambur, 1917. How can one be certain that these amazingly bold stories did not contain an alternative language of denial for Kadumburi other than suicide? The impersonation of personal grief through weaving of words suits the legendary writer. Is the nameless Mejogurani an expression of such an option? Majorani is apparently timid, void of any direct descent, and comprises the home, not only for Nikhilesh, but also for outgoing Bimola. The Ranis of the palace of Shukshayor never appeared before the Dewan. That evening, Nikhilesh came to know that riots had broken out. He went out to stand by his people. At that moment, Majorani felt no constraints for appearing. She asked for the Dewan and ordered him to bring Nikhilesh back by any means. When the bells of evening worship rang out from the temple of the palace, Bimola could not move a step from the window, but she was certain that Majorani was sitting at the temple with palms joined in silent prayer. This certainty was perhaps Bimola's true shelter amidst the turmoil of the home and the world. A little less than five decades after Kadumburi's death, once Tego said, the eyes of Notun Bhutan are so vividly inscribed in my mind that whenever I wish to depict human faces, they seem glowing before me. I can never get over them. Does Tagore hide a greater truth in garb of this genuine statement? Not only the eyes, but the entire personality remained inscribed in his mind. Can that glow be impersonated as darkness within the diversity of minor female characters? This is also a painting. It has just been painted with words rather than with brush strokes. It is indeed one of the many options of reading the home and the world. One such option of reading the last poem, Sheshir Kovita, 1929, may persuade the readers to locate in Jogomaya a lost dimension of the novel. Let us recall Jogomaya's response to Omit's words and actions much before Labonno and Omit parted. Your tones don't reflect gravity of someone mature enough to marry. I hope that the entire thing does not become a farcical child marriage. Can one relate this utterance of Jogomaya to her past? The third section of the novel called Purbo Katha, preface, narrates with immense precision how she had lived through the whims of both the 90, Enlightenment of 19th century Bengal and the pre-Enlightenment Shonathan tradition. Jogoma might have realized that freedom could be as exacting as bindings in pretense of advancement. The novel merely deals with her after Labonno and Omit parted. Thus Jogomaya, with her caged conjugal life and free widowhood remained a lost dimension of the last poem. Let me end by recalling a brief episode from Quartet, Choturongo, 1916, which deals with an intensely contemporary 
yet timeless theme. Nobin was a Kirtan singer in the troupe of Leela Nandoshami. Nobin's wife discovered that her younger sister and Nobin were intimate enough. She insisted her husband marry her sister. She did not need much persuading either. The marriage over, Nobin's first wife took her own life with poison. This was perhaps the sole form of protest she could register against her humiliation. Damini responded to this death with the heart-rending utterance to Shochish. You people are constantly talking of love and nothing but love. Look at the girl who died, waylaid by the demon of love, Roshi Rakushi in Bengali, waylaid by the demon of love as it drew her down its path and sucked her blood. Way back in 1893, Tagore composed a short story, A Girl in Between, Modho Bortini. Horoshundori, shattered by prolonged illness and yet childless, arranged a second match for her husband two decades and a half after his first marriage. Shoilobala, an idol and intolerant teenager who hardly knew anything of running a household, became the second wife of Horoshundori's husband. Taking care of the household remained the responsibility of Horoshundori. As she had been gradually recovering from her convalescence, Horushundori's body acquired strength and her blood regained its spirit. A group of cohorts appeared in her mind and seemed to announce stridently, you may have written a letter of resignation, but we will not give up our claims. Horushundori's body intended to reject the regulations which she had imposed on herself by her pretense of spontaneous restraint. The awakening of her physical inclinations was vividly narrated by Tagore in words and in untold silence between the words. Such narration is un admittedly not common to Bengali literature, particularly more than a century and a quarter back, even today, the expression of sexual desire by a woman is more or less a social taboo. Did the same physical and metaphysical isolation provoke Nobin's wife to take poison? Her younger sister was possibly not as immature as Shoilobala. She was perhaps freed from the obligations of household hosts after the second marriage of her husband. Thus, the void in her daily living was unbearable. Had she not experienced the life and death of Nobin's wife, Damini's journey to remain real to the last might have been different. The end of ja Damini's journey was marked by the full tide of anguish and tears. Who knows whether the torment of the deceased wife of Nobin was not blended with the passion of leaving Horoshundori in that tide. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Rushuti Shen. May I now invite uh, everybody to join me, uh, Tonika Sharkar, Shukriya Chaudhary. Rushuti Shen, please keep your, um, you know, your, your video and microphone on. Um, let's uh, start a sort of uh, a conversation um, about these absolutely fascinating talks. Um, I have already so, so many questions, um, but let me ask, let me start with a sort of general question to all, all three of you, I, I suppose. Um, I mean, there is no reason, you know, to expect, of course, consistency over a lifetime of creative works. But I wonder if I could get the panel to explore a little further the relationship of Romindranath's complex views on modernity, along with his complex views on women. So I guess what I'm asking is, perhaps it's a little unfair, but I'm just wondering, would you say his ambivalence towards modernity drives 
the range of his women characters? Or is it his idealization of women that is intrinsically tied to his ambivalence towards modernity? Um, who would you like to take that? Go, all of you, I suppose, or any of you. I just, I, I, you know, you don't have to take it in the way I asked it. I'm just interested in that, in his complex views, both about women and about modernity and how they, uh, how they, they lie against each other. So yeah, Shupriyadi, please go ahead. Um, well, this is a very important question, Raka, and I think that, you know, I was sort of hinting at it or uh, about, you know, hinting at my uh, rather uh, divided feelings on it towards the end of my presentation. I think that, uh, as you correctly say, uh, Rabindranath changes uh, over time. And yet what is most perplexing about his work and this is a point made by uh, my co-panelists, is that you often find a very early work uh, giving a startling insight or uh, providing a startling, startlingly modern perspective, which is not then uh, corroborated in a somewhat later piece of writing. So although there may be a progressive engagement over uh, the long years of his life with various kinds, various uh, manifestations, one might say, of the modern woman, for example, in Sheshe Kovita, you might find that there is actually something much more revolutionary and highly charged and interesting that he says in a very early work, perhaps a short story or something like that. So this question of modernity, also, I am not so sure that Rabindranath was as much of an idealist especially in his fiction, as he is made out to be. In, in a sense, he has a kind of um, uh, otherworldly idealism. But at the same time, he's very, very much aware of the impossibility of finding that ideal corroborated by the, the world that we inhabit. And uh, most of his writing uh, bears this out. Even the strongest and most um, remarkable women characters have to face uh, tragic loss and self-division. Uh, so I, um, I, I don't think that one can speak of uh, a, a gradual progression or a movement towards a more open and generous point of view. There is some, some change, some progression, but it's not as consistent, it's not a consistent story of evolution. In fact, I think towards the end of the life, he, uh, his life, he becomes more depressed and uh, you know, in some ways uh, more conservative. Uh, the novel Joga Jog is a very, um, very dark novel in many, many, many ways. Would somebody else like to come in yeah. on this? Yes. Tonika? Uh, yeah, I think Raka, my whole uh, presentation was, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, you know, deals with your very interesting question. And uh, I would like to ask you, when for him does the modern start and what would the modern encompass? Because it's again, not a self-identical thing. And Mejo Bourani is as much a part of the modern world as uh, Bimala is. So what is, uh, who is the modern, who is the uh, Shekal and Ekal and so on, uh, that, those times and so on. Uh, I would uh, slightly differ with Shupriya's uh, comment on Joga Jog. Yes, it's a dark novel. And I congratulate you for that wonderful uh, translation and introduction. Uh, it's a dark novel, but uh, it, it's a, it's not a refusal of modernity. In fact, yeah. it is, uh, uh, what shall I say? It is depressed because it doesn't see it, um, you know, it, it kind of identifies its thwarted possibilities within. So I would like to prefer terms like conservative and slightly more liberal because liberals also had a great deal of limitations in various, uh, aspects of their thinking. And Rabindranath never transcended all of that. 
uh, okay so i think his uh, modern was a very complicated phenomenon and uh, he would sometimes as with shunetra and bibhavati he would sometimes make the older generation more yeah. liberal more confident uh, exactly. more transgressive than he would make the the younger generation which sticks to the astrological chart and goes by it so i would think he was conflicted there so should we all be because the modern is not a very easy term and it doesn't point in one direction i saw a complaint that i was talking too fast being pressed in the middle you know i was hardly breathing as i was talking so i hope my answer was more or less uh, uh, comprehensible i'm muted um rushati shen uh, i just want to refer to a short story which was written as early as 1892 that is more than one decade or at least one decade before choker bali i don't know what can be a good translation shukriya di tag tag it's a very it's a very interesting short story where tego supported widow remarriage in a very subtle way and uh, when we are talking of modernity in 80, as early as 1892 she could write such a story where hemonto um could disobey his father who was quite an influential person in the society uh, and decided not to abandon her his wife even after knowing that she had been a widow and then hemonto's father disowned his son as well as daughter in law and there the story ended and this story was written as early as 1892 tag is the name of the story actually the uh, tonika this presentation reminds me of the story and after that your question is also mm emphasizing this particular um thank you for that um i have one more general question and then i'll ask a couple of specific questions um so there are several stories in which women are sort of the drivers of social change the famous ones minal in you know stri potro or or shodamini in modnam um there are also stories where sort of women have a strong enough sense of self and justice so that they won't forgive those who have wounded them like chandra in shasti like that several people have referred to can you talk a little bit and and many of you have referred all three of you have referred to some of these characters how do you think he sort of understood the range of possible nonconformism what are his range of non you know what, what, what just just to, you know can you reflect a little bit on sort of the range of nonconforming women what did they not you know what were the bases of their non of their nonconforming That that most interested him or us. Rushat, let's start with you. To talk about the range when we are relating it to Tagore. I know, I know, that's the thing. From Nandini of Red Oleanders to Chitrangada, Sadharon <laughs> me, it's very difficult. But maybe the ones who stand out as the most interesting non-conforming women. Tonika you are muted are you taking them in any order shupriya going first and in the order in which we no, spoke no anybody who wants to start so why don't you start go ahead yeah it's difficult to say and i'll again restrict myself to fiction uh, because yeah. you know that's easier to tackle really uh, i think uh, where he went furthest was his absolute conviction about the woman's uh mental intellectual and emotional autonomy 
or maybe even sexual autonomy, okay? And if that is violated, uh, any amount of transgression is justified, okay? Uh, he does not like to see the woman in politics. That's something which, with rare exceptions in later short stories, that's something which frightens him. But to be uh, or fair, he doesn't like to see the man in politics either. And he comprehensively, uh, you know, um, uh, deconstructed all forms of nationalist politics, uh, except for the constructive social work, uh, building up something like Gandhian bases, village bases, and so on. So I would say he would allow his women, uh, but in that sense, widowhood makes a difference because uh, widowhood blocks all possible forms of autonomy. And he is not very comfortable with the uh, uh, consequences of transgressing its limits. Uh, Rushoti did point to tag, but again, that's child widowhood, which he talks about in, uh, you know, uh, in relation to Bidashagur. He trans forms with the Shagor's uh, widowhood camp, uh, widow remarriage campaigns into child widow remarriage campaigns. So he, um, you know, married off his own son to a child widow. And a lot of conservative pundits of those times were agreeable to that. So I think there is a kind of conflict there between the aesthetic of renunciation and the woman's autonomy outside of that, so far as widowhood is concerned. But with the wife, on the other hand, or with the unmarried girl in his later, uh, you know, uh, stories and fiction, he, uh, you know, it, it is just that they should leave an unjust uh, um, household and defy the world, so to speak. Yeah. Um, it's a it's a complex question, um, Raka, and I'm glad you asked it. For me, the character of Anandamui in Gora is a very important one. I think uh, she uh, shows a kind of um, uh, determination and also a kind of uh, self-containment, which is uh, for uh, Rabindranath uh, an exemplary, uh, you know, uh, stance. Uh, because in a sense, uh, she is confined within her household, she doesn't step out of it. And yet within that household, she uh, is consistently, I think, uh, radical, because if you look at the, the adoption of Gora to uh, her, you know, standing by him uh, at the end, I think uh, uh, she is a very, very complex, very, very interesting uh, figure. Uh, as to um, uh, you know, a, a kind of progression. I don't think, I think that all my co-panelists have pointed out that there isn't precisely a progression in his fiction from a more conservative point of view to a more liberal and open stance. You have surprising uh, instances of um, an extraordinarily liberal and progressive uh, character uh, with the, at the same time, Tagore taking rather um, conservative decisions in his personal life and perhaps returning to some uh, slightly more uh, difficult uh, um, you know, morally difficult situation in, in a later work. Uh, to me, um, Ghori Baide is a very perplexing text. You know, I mean, it always has been for me one of the most difficult of the texts that we need to understand because it cannot be interpreted, in my opinion, in moral terms. It can't be interpreted in political terms. It is really a, a, a history of uh, the psyche, as it were. I mean, it, it really works at, um, at, at something that is much more complex and, and, uh, uh, and uh, important uh, than uh, simple, uh, you know, the, the dogmatism of saying that one is for something or against something. Uh, for me, uh, the complexity of Ghori Baide is really uh, one sort of a way in where one might search for an answer to your uh, to, to your question. 
Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Rushuti? Well, uh, one thing I must point out that, of course, it will, it is in parity with my topic of today's presentation also that in many cases, the minor or so-called insignificant characters of Tagore go with the most revolutionary statement, you know. If we consider Maloti in Noti Puja, it is such a, such an insignificant character, but actually in her statement, she was so distinct. And on the other side of the range, we must say um, in relationships, Joga Jog, the novel, which again came out as a book in 1929, Tego selected Nistarini, a very simple girl, better known as Moti's mother in the household of the Ghoshals, to foresee the indignity and humiliation that Kumudini would have to bear in her encounter with her husband, Modhushudan. You know, um, it is true that Moti's mother could not sustain her realization and agony till the end of the novel. But the 23rd section of the novel, brilliantly translated by Shukriyadi, the 23rd section of the novel, which really deals with the uh, observations, thought, and despair of Moti's mother, has a very important bearing on the final message of the novel. Often her minor characters are quite significant. Thank you so much. Um, we have only a few minutes left and I, let me just ask this uh, question that uh, I would go back to uh, Shukriyadi because there's this question that's been haunting me since um, you you spoke, which is that you have this sense of the oppressive bourgeois, the inside of the of this bourgeois household, urban, bourgeois, internal, inside, and then you have sort of the rural outside. And I'm wondering if there is anything about sort of rural insides and urban outsides that um that you can bring to bear on this uh, or, or or was it just yeah it, it, can you just think a little bit or, or or share with us your thoughts about about how he thought about rural insides and urban outsides um yes well thank you very much uh i um you know i don't think uh, i wanted to give uh, the impression uh, that the urban interior is necessarily more oppressive than the rural interior. That I think is, uh, would be a wrong perception. In fact, uh, starting with some observations about uh, the short story, the landscape within which the early short stories um, uh, are set, uh, because they are written when he was himself resident on the family estates in Shilaidaho. Um, I said that even in within this landscape, where there is the possibility of, um, uh, of, of a certain kind of freedom or a sense of oneness with nature, even here women are oppressed and uh, they are indeed confined. Uh, for example, think of the beginning of Shasti, uh, where you know, there's it's a dark, dep dank, uh, depressing day, there is no food at home, the women cannot cook because there is nothing to eat. Um, you know, they are sitting there idly and, and the sky is lowering over them so that even, you know, both the outside and the inside seem to give that same impression of darkness and emptiness and, and, and you know, hopelessness uh, because uh, the women have not eaten and they can't cook for the men. And then ultimately, of course, um, this woman is killed by her husband. And it's a very common example of what, what, what seems uh, for um, Robin Yard to capture the um, poverty and hopelessness of, of rural life. So there's certainly no contrast of the ideal rural with the, uh, you know, 
a relatively more prosperous uh, bourgeois household. Moreover, you have, for example, in, um, yeah, no, I know that you didn't quite say that, but- Yeah, no, I meant the ideal I, was yeah, the outside yeah, of the room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, outside, the ideal outside. Uh, yeah. and, and for example, in, uh, you know, um, Monihara, in Monihara, that house actually is in the countryside. The woman is very unhappy to be there, uh, though she is uh, fond of her jewels and enjoys dressing up in her, in her silks and her jewels. But it is uh, an isolated house in the countryside. And, it, you know, there is that sense of longing, the woman's longing as she, you know, looks out of the window. And then she ultimately disappears into that uh, charged landscape with her jewels. And so, you know, is it a story about property or is it a story about landscape? There, there is uh, that that problem there. Uh, so I I um, I I'm not uh, sure uh, that uh, one can make this uh, this this contrast as uh, you know in the way that, that uh, you're doing. Uh, could you just remind me of the of the main point of your question? Sorry, no, I was again. just sort of talking, just reflecting on your talk about the yes. sort of. Um, the way in which the rural landscape seemed yes. more um, more open, oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. ideal. I, I'm, I'm not yeah. sure. I'm not sure that it is. You see, because within that rural landscape, there are so many stories of oppression and harm and great injustice uh, done to women. Uh, this uh, Shasti is just one example. There are many others. Uh, so, uh, and within the um, the urban, within the urban, you said, you know, is there some example of freedom and space within the urban? Sorry, outside. Sorry, the outside, the urban outside. Yes, uh, yes. Well, there are a few references uh, to women who, um, um, Oporichita, for example, or um, you know, th there are women who go out and do do work and and, and so on. And um, uh, Charudhe, Charudhe, where. Uh, you know, uh, the, the, there's this freedom fighter, and you know, it's it's a very oppressive. I mean, it's oddly, it's a very oppressive novel where every all spaces seem to be confined, and yet these uh, this woman is actually engaged in political work. She is um, uh, she is a, a freedom fighter and um, capable of sacrificing herself uh, for the country. So I think these contrasts are not simply between the rural and the urban, but between a kind of choice of life and. That is what Rabindranath is particularly interested in, and the autonomy of that choice. I mean, how is that choice made, and how is it for women? How is it justified to themselves? And that autonomy of choice is what what he builds his hope on, even in uh, the, this uh, late unfinished novel uh, Joga Jog. Uh, where you know I may have given a rather more negative view of it, but my view is not negative because ultimately, in that open ending, there is the hope of a choice uh, made even by the pregnant wife who must return to her husband's household and to that uh, confining space of the Antopu. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm sorry I was not more clear with my my question. Let me turn to the um, to the many questions that the audience has um, has already asked uh, has asked and uh, um, let me just because you've answered many uh, of these questions in, in you know in, in a different way as we have been speaking together um, you know the, let me pick a question that uh, hasn't really been addressed um, one is for you uh, uh, Tony Kadi one is about sort of uh, Nazia Manzoor is interested to know about your take on uh, Kadom, Kadombini from Jibita Amrito. And uh, she says, um, in my reading, Kadombini challenges the prescribed script for ascetic widow widowhood. Um, and it's a strict disciplinary regime when she believes herself to be dead, um, a pretota or a, or a shadow. The fact that she dies in the end, which is tied to her love for her brother-in-law's young boy, perhaps challenges the autonomy. I wonder where, where you would place that story in Tagore's uh, thoughts on widowhood. Hey, thank you, Nazia, for that 
very interesting question and bringing back Kadambori into the dis uh, Kadambini into the discussion. Mm, I wouldn't say she quite challenges uh, widowhood conventions because all she does is to, uh, you know, she was taken for dead and she was about to be cremated when she, uh, the cremation was incomplete and she came back to life and people began to suspect that it was an evil spirit and not a live woman. So she had to die a second death to prove that she was alive. And it's a great, great story, very chilling. Um, so, uh, you know, she otherwise fulfills the role of the widow. She doesn't have a child of her own, but she loves the sister-in-law's, uh, the brother-in-law's child and so on. But the emphasis on her death, not once, but twice is, uh, so, uh, reminds us of possibly uh, meant to remind us that widowhood in itself is something like a social death, not a physical one, but a social and sexual death. Uh, that, uh, um, you know, your life is over for all practical purposes. Uh, that is a life of your own is over. Now you can live only through uh, uh, disinterestedly serving others, others' children, others' uh, households, and so on. Yeah. Um, there is a question that um, sort of asks about um, Rabindranath sort of, let me just read it. Um, Gupta. It is often said that uh, Tagore's lyric voice is remarkably androgynous and that there seems to be an alternation if not porosity between the male and female voice in his song poems, would you say that he is able to assimilate, appropriate, and even abstract the female voice because the medium does not demand that a woman be concretized in her socioeconomic reality here? It would be interesting also to learn how you uh, relate your articulations to the women in his paintings. So now let me bring in sort of song poems and paintings and so sort of opening up to uh, the, the larger, um, the, the larger uh, sort of creative scapes uh, of uh, Rabindranath. Um, Rushuti, can we start with you? If you have any reflections on this? Well, no, I don't think. Who <laughs> Tagore's poems within such a short time? I, I won't be able to. Okay. Um, any thoughts, uh, either Tonika Di or Shupriyadi? Uh, I think Shukriyadi has something to tell us about poems, you told us. Uh, I think Tonika wanted to respond. Why don't you, Tonika, yeah, would, would you like to go first and then I'll say something? No, you can take on. No, no, please, 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 go ahead. No, it's, a, it's again a long-standing poetic convention that the man speaks in the borrowed female voice. Whatever a female voice is meant to convey, I don't know. What we identify as female voice in Bengali literature or in, in any literature is often represented by men. And through, by borrowing the woman's voice, sometimes men uh, communicate how they want to be loved, I think. And therefore, uh, poems especially, traditionally have opened up a more androgynous space uh, where you cannot distinguish between who is actually speaking on behalf of whom and for whether uh, it's, you know, someone is speaking for oneself. Uh, in paintings, Rabindranath's uh, paintings, I mean, it's difficult to quickly respond to this, but, uh, you know, they are, curiously degendered. And Rabindranath's paintings, I think in some ways, and the point has been made by Ketoki Kushari Dyson and others, that uh, they are in some ways the darker alter ego of the kind of Rabindranath we find elsewhere. Uh, sometimes, you know, there is kind of flames bursting through black and they are quite uh, terrifying. Uh, and I think the faces and the bodies, and he uses the nude quite often, as uh, Ketokidi pointed out, uh, which uh, is quite rare otherwise. Uh, 
uh, but uh, you know the, the faces are extremely degendered both men and women have elongated faces uh, highly elongated faces the features are very similar sometimes the woman wears a veil and that's how you and their expressions are very identical what they are meant to convey or whether he wanted to make a point through that i'm not sure but that's how i see them regarding poems can we refer back to some poems of pola toka or poems of shishu and shishu bolanat where the voice of mother voice of the the correspondence between the child and the mother was sometimes very important in the poems of Shishu and Shishu Bolana. And of course, in the poems of Paula Toka, it is not a question of borrowing female voice, but the poems like Nishkriti or Hari Java. And these poems are were written at the time when I think the death of her eldest, uh, the death of his eldest daughter was a closely contemporary event. Um, I, I, uh, I understand what you're saying, Rushuti, but I uh, actually I agree much more with Tonika on this. I do think that it is it has become uh, rather conventional to say that you know the great poet is androgynous uh, that uh, this is uh, almost a convention of a certain kind of literary criticism that the true poet's voice is androgynous and uh, there is a convention in Boishna poetry particularly of appropriating the female voice and this is a tradition by which Rabindranath himself was very much influenced in, in, in his early writings uh, so the appropriation of the female voice uh, is, uh, you know, it often expresses the longings, the desires that masculinity, uh, or at least that is to say the gendered space of the masculine in, uh, in its social uh, manifestations uh, does not permit. So what we speak of as the feminine or the female is obviously the male understanding of a domain which although it cannot be accessed, can be understood as the opposite of the formal uh, manifestations of the masculine in uh, social, uh, social interactions. And uh, Rabindranath is very good at, at you know, accessing some of those feelings. And of course, some of those feelings are also, obviously, most of them, Rabindranath is uh, accessible to uh, to women. I mean, I don't. I would never say that uh, our access to great literature is, um, you know, is sort of um, uh, entirely determined by our own uh, gender orientation, so that we cannot access certain feelings simply because we are locked into our own gender boundaries. That is not, I think, a point that anybody is making. But uh, the idea that uh, this, uh, the, the poet has a claim on a kind of um, idealized androgyny, I am a little uncomfortable with that, uh, with that um, supposition, especially the claim to the, the feminine voice, the, the voice of, of the woman. We have yeah, one here. Go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Uh -huh. Yes. So just one small point that uh, Shishu and Shishu Bolanath, I should say that there Rabindranath brings in something entirely new in Shishu particularly, the father-daughter relationship, yes. the infant-daughter really, uh, uh, through these poems. I don't think that existed in our literature before that, the father's tenderness and his enjoyment of the little girl. Infant girl. Right. And also the mother-son relationship, the very first... That was there in Agomani songs and... It's really brilliant. And I think it's really interesting, uh, this, this last point that you made, Tonikadi, because we've been talking about Tagore and the, and the women and the wives and daughters and, and, and widows, but um, we haven't really perhaps thought enough about, her, you know, the, the sort of... Um, not just men as patriarchs, but men as tender fathers. And I think that's uh, that's really uh, very interesting. It's 8.29 and I'm, I'm afraid we won't have um, an opportunity to ask uh, any other questions. Uh, 
you have the 17 wonderful, wonderful questions. And um, I hope that, uh, you know, we'll have some, an opportunity to, to reflect on them. Um, so I am afraid I, ha I do have to bring this um, wonderful event to a close. The fact that there are so many questions is, is really testament to how engaged um, everybody was. So let me thank everybody, Rushwati Shin, Tonika Sharkar, Shupriya Choudhury. Thank you to the audience for tuning in and for asking such thoughtful and perceptive questions. Thank you to Punita, Sanchita, and the incredible staff of the Institute. Um, you know, I want to sort of remind people that the program continues until uh, February 14th. Um, on Saturday, February 13th, there's, uh, there's a presentation of, of Dag Ghar. And on Sunday, there is a concert by Intiaz Ahmed. So please remember though that the, the time for Sunday, the Sunday event is a little different. It will be from 12 noon to 1 p.m. or so PST and more details are available at the festival homepage. Um, recordings of all past uh, Tagore Festival events may be viewed on the festival homepage also. So once again, I'm sorry this, uh, to bring this to a close, but thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Um, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you. And thank, thank you, you Pushita thank and you. others. Thank you, Tonikari, and thank you, Rushati. Thank, thank you, Shukriya and Rushati. <laughs>